This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help me produce more content like this and get early access to every new video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. How many dramatic news stories have you seen about the world running out of food? How many times have you heard someone justify horrible ideas based on the notion that there's simply not enough to go around? The world is a big place, and we have a lot of mouths to feed, but the problem may not be what you think it is. In this episode, we're going to examine whether the Earth is actually short on food, and look at the broader trends in food production and consumption around the world. Let's rewind a bit. It took thousands of years for the human population to reach the roughly 7.8 billion individuals we have today. From the very first Homo sapiens around 200,000 years ago up until 1804, there were fewer than 1 billion humans on Earth. Then, in just 123 years, the population doubled to 2 billion. More recently, it only took 12 years for the latest billion humans to appear. Our incredible technological advances in medicine, education, and food production since the Industrial Revolution have improved our survival chances and provided enough food for billions more mouths than ever before possible. While this is cause for celebration and admiration of Homo sapiens' achievements, it also raises an important question. How long is this trend going to continue? Food insecurity is becoming a growing concern. All the way back in 1798, the economist Robert Malthus realized that in a world of limited resources, exponential growth cannot be sustained indefinitely and will eventually lead to a dramatic collapse once the growing species overshoots the ability of its support system to provide it with resources. Of course, any time Malthus is mentioned, we also need to add the disclaimer that there's a reason the term Malthusian is used as an insult. The views espoused by Robert Malthus have been claimed in more recent years by some of the most repugnant groups imaginable. These groups use the economist theories to justify eugenics and racial bigotry to an extreme degree. But regardless of this vocal minority, we still need to consider these questions. Have we already reached this limit? Are we getting close to it? The number of malnourished people around the world is still shockingly high, and millions die from hunger every year. In a world where obesity is the leading cause of death from heart disease and cancer, the top killers in the US, how is it that we still have more than 9 million people dying from hunger every year? To put that number in perspective, every year hunger kills more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. It kills more people than the total population of the world's 72 smallest countries. And most of its victims, 5.3 million of them, are children. But food insecurity does not limit itself to the number of people dying from hunger. It also includes the millions of people who lack access to quality, nutritious foods on a daily basis. While most people in Western countries can generally rely on the availability of food in supermarkets, many around the world are not so lucky. In war-torn Syria, a country which, we should note, suffers under the boot of monstrous US sanctions, women have to stand in line for up to seven hours for their allotted quota of bread at this very moment. To make matters worse, human-induced climate change threatens our existing food supplies as fresh water begins to run out in many hotter regions. The rise in temperatures also allows new pests to survive in regions that were previously too cool, wiping out entire years' worth of crops and causing famines in some regions of the world. Yet another factor adding to food insecurity is the ever-rising cost of producing food. Farmers at the bottom of the food production process earn little to nothing for their goods, and many are forced to buy seasonal seeds from multinational corporations, meaning that every year they need to buy more or fail to produce their crops. Food production is now part of a global system designed to generate capital, not ensure food security. So why are all these problems worsening to the extent that they threaten that most basic necessity of life? The most vocal claim that population growth is the real problem. Too many mouths to feed and too little food to go around. The Malthusian theory of exponential growth. While this theory is likely correct for any system with limited resources, it did not take into account more modern methods of production, and it would only become a problem for us once we exhausted our tremendous supply of resources. But is our current problem really one of population overshooting resources, or is it more insidious? Is food insecurity just an inevitable consequence of humanity's growth, or could it be due to other factors? Maybe our running out of food is not due to the number of people we need to feed, but to a system that is failing to do its supposed job. Here are a few facts that should make it obvious there is something going terribly wrong with our global food system. One third of all food produced globally goes to waste. 1.3 billion tons, or one trillion dollars of food, are wasted every year. And just one quarter of the food wasted by the EU, UK, and US could feed all the world's hungry. There are many other statistics like this, 
but all of them point to one simple fact. There is more than enough food for everyone, but our food system guarantees that some will go hungry. We do not currently have a problem of supply and demand, we have a problem of production and distribution. Food insecurity is not a natural result of population growth, but a man-made crisis caused by a failing, inhumane system. As with many basic human necessities under a capitalist system, food is a commodity to be traded in order to make a profit. The more food we produce and sell, the more money there is to be made. So under the guise of tackling food security to provide for all, we have developed intensive farming methods to produce ever greater quantities at ever lower prices. This race to the bottom in food prices has come at tremendous cost, both in terms of food quality and environmental damage. We have built ever more efficient methods of trawling the seas, more efficient ways of jamming livestock into small spaces, and more efficient ways of producing more crops on less land. For decades, the environmental cost of these practices was ignored and any way to improve yield was seen as a good way forward. Today, we are finally realizing the price we're about to pay for such reckless intensification of food production. Fish is the number one source of protein in the world, yet 80% of the world's fish stocks are overfished and on the brink of collapse. Super trawlers continue to destroy seabeds and pull out hundreds of tons of fish every year, regardless of size, age, or species. The trawling done in the North Sea alone is equivalent to bulldozing the Amazon rainforest seven times a year. At the current rate of destruction, the world will run out of seafood in 2048, at which point food insecurity will affect billions across the planet. The impact of agriculture on the world's ecosystems by far eclipses the damage done by any other industry. As we continue to wrestle with a worldwide pandemic, we may want to pause and think about how the meat and dairy industries have been contributing to the development of super pathogens for several decades. In the US, 80% of all antibiotics produced by pharmaceutical companies are sold to be used on animals. The appalling conditions factory animals live in force them into such close and constant contact that the only way to avoid disease outbreaks is to pump them full of antibiotics. We know that overuse of these drugs is the most likely factor to lead to antibiotic-resistant diseases, some of which may evolve to become unstoppable. When this happens, the impact on the human food supply will be devastating. It isn't just antibiotics, though. Raising animals to be used as food produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector. This is made worse by the ever-increasing deforestation of vast parts of the Amazon and other rainforests, which in turn releases more carbon from cutting trees. Destroying forests to raise cattle or grow single crops causes the loss of essential biodiversity and leaves our food supply vulnerable to disease and climate change, as single species do not have the resilience of whole ecosystems. Finally, manure and waste from intensive animal agriculture cause eutrophication, the death of lakes and rivers covered by algal blooms, and ocean dead zones, turning freshwater toxic and killing millions of aquatic animals. All this to produce a food that consumes billions of gallons of water, countless acres of land, and tons of crops that could otherwise be used for humans. Converting crops into meat is the most inefficient way of using the food we grow and is directly responsible for worsening the climate and food crises we've caused. The environmental damage goes on, but the purpose of this video is not to discuss the negative effects of modern agriculture, but rather to point out how relying on this system to produce our food will inevitably lead to a climatic collapse which will destroy our food supply and leave billions to starve. So why do we keep going? Why don't we stop this obviously ridiculous spiral into irreparable damage? The answer is simple. There is more immediate profit to be made from continuing as we are than by fixing the system. There is currently no political interest in overhauling our food system and transitioning to new methods that could ensure food security for all humans and the continued livability of our planet. In fact, the exact opposite is true. Political will currently uses taxpayer money to incentivize and subsidize industries that, at this rate, have no future. Both economically and environmentally, the modern meat, dairy, and fishing industries make absolutely no sense. The cost of fish, meat, or milk in supermarkets and restaurants is unbelievably low, especially when compared to fresh greens, despite the availability of fish having collapsed worldwide and the production of beef being vastly more resource-intensive than vegetables. This phenomenon makes no sense economically nor ecologically, and it threatens food security worldwide. It would take a whole episode of its own to cover this topic sufficiently, but it's enough to say that the only things keeping this absurdity going are the lobbying and financial interests of the meat, dairy, and pharmaceutical lobbies, as well as the political fear of causing more job losses in a dying industry. There are very real solutions to tackling food insecurity, solutions that have been obvious for a long time, and just require some financing and political will to implement. 
Ensuring there is enough food for everyone today and in the future is a matter of organization and prioritization, not population control. The death of the oceans and the exhaustion of our soils is inevitable if we continue with business as usual. But a more positive alternative is also possible. A world where all human beings have enough to eat without the degradation and depletion of the planet's natural resources. However, to get there, we need a complete overhaul of our food system as it exists today. We need to fundamentally shift from producing food for its economic value to producing food with the sole purpose of making sure no one goes hungry. We don't need to change everything overnight either. These essential changes could be implemented over a transition period empowering our current farmers and fishers to help in the struggle against climate catastrophe and food insecurity. With the right political and financial backing, we could transform the food system as we know it. First, we need to redistribute our current food supply to solve the ongoing hunger crisis. Second, we need to subsidize regenerative farming techniques, ban the use of destructive methods, and end subsidies for foods that harm societal and planetary health. We already understand plant biology enough to design permaculture farms that yield far more food per unit area than intensive farms while repairing our soils. This would also make healthy foods affordable to the average citizen, boosting overall health. What's more, new technology is making vertical farms and self-sustaining cities possible. Finally, we need to continue expanding work in nutrition science that reveals exactly what foods are good for the human body, so we can focus on providing the world's population with quality, nutritious food instead of the mass-produced poison offered by multinational food conglomerates. The bottom line is this. Our food system is failing both the well-fed and the hungry, and will inevitably lead to a terrible global famine. To end this cycle of self-destruction, we must transform the way we see food, and transform the kinds of food we produce and the way we produce it, for everyone's sake. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. This kind of video, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. In order to pay the bills and keep this channel running, I rely on AdSense revenue, sponsors, and donations from generous viewers. By producing content like this, I lose out on both sponsors and AdSense. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every episode at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.